They ambushed my dad with experimental quantum bombs. Still cost them most of Europe. <laughs> Interesting. Then they just wore me down. Brought me when I finally had to sleep. Welcome back, everyone. It's Charlie. This will be my full Invincible Season 2, Episode 2 video. There's a whole bunch of Easter eggs and references, so we'll break it all down. If you're brand new to the channel, be sure to subscribe to get all the episodes. Careful for spoilers if you haven't seen the episode yet. We'll just start at the beginning, work our way through shot by shot, talking about Easter eggs, WTF moments, starting with the episode title, In About Six Hours, I Lose My Virginity to a Fish. It's a reference to a couple different things. In the context of the episode, it's about Mark thinking that he's going to have to marry Queen Aquaria, who's played by Tatiana Maslany, who's She-Hulk in the Marvel Universe. She also voiced one of the Lizard League characters in the Adam Eve prequel. I'll explain later in the video. Move deeper into the lab. Our intel was spotty, but the serum should be on this level. There are a lot of actors on the Invincible show that play multiple characters, so you probably recognize some voices showing up all over the place. The title is also a joke on Mark still being a virgin, which they make fun of later in the episode, and just the twist in general, like the whole idea of him theoretically having to marry this Atlantan, is a reference to Robert Kirkman's parody of the Superman comics and a twist during those. Recently in an interview, Robert Kirkman revealed one of his favorite types of stories were like the really wacky, over-the-top, comic booky type of stories, as opposed to like the really down-to-earth kind of stories. In one of the stories he specifically referenced was the time that Superman almost wound up marrying a mermaid in the OG Superman comics. Back in Superman issue number 129 in 1959, so a long time ago, there was a character called Lori Lamaris who was secretly a mermaid that Superman briefly had an intense relationship with and almost got married to. But essentially, that really weird, wacky kind of adventure is the inspiration for these Invincible comics that this is based on in the episode. The actual opening scene is their high school graduation. The principal is named Winslow, and the school is named Reginald Vell Johnson High School. You probably detected the Easter egg here. The Winslow character is played by real-life actor Reginald Vell Johnson, who played Carl Winslow during Family Matters. So it's like this crazy meta Easter egg. They even animate the character to look just like real-life Reginald Vell Johnson. Apparently, Robert Kirkman, just a really big fan of Reginald Vell Johnson back in the day when he was first creating the Invincible comics. The graduation speech is meant to be a metaphor for all the challenges that Mark is facing, trying to prove himself trustworthy to everyone, prove to himself that he's not like his father Omni-Man, that he can still be a hero, and sort of foreshadowing the challenges that he will face and how his power levels will have to increase. They finally bring back the William character in this episode. Invincible is absent because he's been working for Cecil at the Global Defense Agency, and he's been working overtime trying to prove himself like 24-7. Adam Eve is here because she's considering herself temporarily retired from active superhero business, but there are continuing things in the background sort of trying to pull her back into the game, so to speak. They kind of address that with her arc in this episode. Eventually, whether she wants to or not, she will be forced to become a superhero again. Invincible is in the middle of dealing with Doc Seismic, who they tease at the end of season one. It's basically him cleaning up that mess from the season one finale. They use the fight scene mostly for comedy, like Doc Seismic referencing that he's not a professor, because actually I never really taught at university, even though he has a PhD, which he makes fun of later at the graduation ceremony, like case against higher education because Dr. Seismic is crazy. They don't actually explain what his PhD is in, maybe geology because he's so obsessed with that. His whole bit is that he wants to reclaim certain parts of nature, but not all of nature. Just the geological formations, like all the rocks, all the metals, that kind of stuff. That's why he jokes about them being able to keep all the wood-based buildings. Isn't that most buildings? You can keep the ones made of wood. And it's why he's attacked the Washington Monument, because it's made of rock and metal. In the original comics, Doc Seismic was meant to be a parody of both Mole Man from the Fantastic Four comics and Shocker from the Spider-Man comics. Notice he also talks to Invincible about himself in third person as if he's narrating his own comic book panels. Do you know what this obscene phallus is constructed from? He asked expecting some idiotic answer. All of his henchmen, the Magmanites, he found underground during season one. When Principal Winslow talks about testing your limits and learning how strong you truly are, it's a reference to Invincible's growing power levels this season and in the future. He's destined to be the most powerful Viltrumite who ever lived, like basically the most powerful person in the universe next to Adam Eve. Theoretically, their power levels are infinite, like there is no actual limit to how powerful they can get with training. 
Cecil and a lot of the other people in this episode address the issue of superhero collateral damage, like when Invincible, for instance, essentially destroys as much stuff as he's saved. So initially, it's kind of a wash for a lot of characters. It's the same problem with Adam Eve, like she tries to help people, but also winds up causing a lot of collateral damage accidentally without realizing it. There are a couple of jokes about Winslow making up a bunch of inspirational quotes. Apparently, he does it all the time, too, because like Mark comes in and is like, oh, did I miss all the fake inspirational quotes? They also reveal what everybody's middle names are in this episode. Amber's middle name is Justine. Mark's middle name is Sebastian. Sebastian probably comes from his mother's side of the family because that's not a Viltrumite name. William's middle name is Francis, and Adam Eve's middle name is Eve, which is how she came up with the Adam Eve name in the first place. When they throw their caps, you notice that Mark accidentally uses too much power and almost throws his cap into orbit. And they give Principal Winslow the invincible title trope, like the opening scene trope of someone almost saying the name of the title, but then stopping short of them saying it and just flashing the logo. Notice there's some continuity with the state of the logo from the logo in episode one. It's still red and cracked after last week's episode because of the events of episode one. It's the same damage reflecting the other universe, the evil version of Invincible and all the stuff that happened. But it cracks a little, showing the original blue logo inside, but with a black Invincible logo to show you more multiverse Easter eggs. That's the idea of multiple different versions of Invincible crossing over. All that Invincible storyline stuff is Angstrom Levy related stuff. There's a lot of multiverse related storytelling right now, but the multiverse stuff on Invincible was actually written back in the early 2000s. So it's just a coincidence that it's happening right now when Marvel is in the middle of their multiverse phase. Like we just had the Loki season two finale, which is heavily, heavily gets into the multiverse. I talked about this during my episode one video too, but there was actually a Marvel crossover with the Invincible comics back in the day. Like he crossed over into a Spider-Man comic. So technically the Marvel universe is just like another universe inside the Invincible multiverse. Also hoping that we see a crossover with the boys TV show just because it's Amazon and Amazon does both of these shows. So they could have a crossover with Homelander, the boys characters just as easily and just canonize the boys universe as another universe inside this multiverse. They celebrated Adam Eve's treehouse from last season. She's still living on her own, but she could continue attending school so that she could graduate. She's not going to college like Mark says that he wants to. They all talk about their plans for the summer. She's going to continue doing humanitarian work, avoiding superhero business for now. Mark's still working for Cecil 24-7. Amber's working for a local politician on the election campaign, doing community work at the center that we saw during season one. William seems like he's the only person who's actually interested in doing anything that like a normal kid would do before college, like actually enjoying his summer. Even though there's the whole subplot with Invincible getting accepted into college with Amber, I don't think any of us expect that to wind up sticking. Like there's no way that he's going to be able to go to college and have a normal life with Amber and also be a superhero. Even if you haven't read the Invincible comics, like you probably sense there's just way, way too many threats out there that are going to demand his time. Like there's no way he's going to have time to go to college. Also probably going to wind up destroying his relationship with Amber. A lot of this part of the storyline is stuff that they're adding that was not in the comics though. Like he had a brief relationship with Amber, but they blew past that really quickly in the comics just because there aren't that many original comics that they can adapt for the TV show. And they want to do like seven seasons of the TV show in their hour long episodes. So they expanded a lot on character stories. So for instance, there's way more Amber stuff going on this first half of season two than there was in the comics. It's the same thing with Mark's mother, too. Like, there isn't nearly as much story on her in the comics. Adam Eve references the reconstruction of Chicago in the wake of Invincible's fight with Omni-Man during the season one finale. The interesting bit here with the booze that Adam Eve creates is that Invincible seems like he and Adam Eve can actually get drunk from drinking the alcohol, despite having super physiology. Maybe she just specifically tunes their beers to have way more alcohol so they can get drunk, as opposed to, like, Amber and William, who are normal humans. If you think about it, Captain America, for instance, in the Marvel Universe, has way less power and he cannot get drunk no matter how much he drinks. So if Invincible is like 10 times, 100 times more powerful than Captain America, he shouldn't be able to get drunk. I think it's mostly to set up the virgin joke with the virgin Mai Tai because she also kind of pokes fun at him for being a virgin still, which is also a bit of foreshadowing too. Not getting into too many spoilers if you haven't read the comics. There's a lot that winds up going on between him, Adam, Eve, even the Amber character, even though a lot of the Amber stuff they're adding for the TV show, even with the Viltrumites in the future like Anissa, but that's like a long ways off. Let's just say Mark will not be a virgin forever. They introduce the Shapesmith character played by Ben Schwartz, who's also the voice of Sonic. You probably recognize him from some other TV show. He's done a bunch of stuff. He's also playing a couple different characters during this episode, but the Shapesmith is a bigger character in the comics. 
He's another Martian who snuck back with the astronauts during season one, impersonating one of the crew members who they left behind, who we see at the end of the episode with the Sequids. They kind of set him up as the replacement for Martian Man, who was a parody of Martian Manhunter. Shave Smith himself is also a bit of a Martian Manhunter parody because his powers are exactly the same as Martian Man. The whole idea is that he's obsessed with becoming a superhero, like he sees Martian Man on TV on the broadcast is like, wait a minute, I'm a Martian, I can do that too. I want everybody to love me on this planet. There's no sinister plan going on behind him or anything like that. It's mostly a comedic bit with him just trying to pretend to be a human really, really badly, like completely failing at it. Pretty much everybody he interacts with knows that something is up, like what is up with this dude? During the meeting though, they also set up the idea of Invincible taking care of the Sequids from Mars who are on their way to Earth at the end of the episode. Adam Eve gets herself into trouble trying to help rebuild apartments in the park, showing that she isn't really considering the big picture. They kind of address this with her talk with her father, even though her father is a terrible person. Even though Adam Eve wants to help people, they're trying to show that a lot of the superheroes in Invincible are similar to the superheroes on The Boys in that they're very narcissistic and usually only think about themselves. Adam Eve isn't that bad, but she's kind of like that, like she isn't really thinking about the consequences of a lot of her powers. When she winds up inadvertently hurting all those people, you could say that she also Britted it to make a community reference. If you didn't realize, it's actually Gillian Jacobs doing the voice of Adam Eve who played Britta on Community. She Britted it. Whatever. I'll run them through again. And you guys are gonna stop using my name to mean making a tiny and understandable mistake. Never make the Britta of Brittaing each other's feelings. You're using it wrong. Wow, you Britta to Britta. Yeah, way to pull an abit. Mark's mom tries and fails to sell their house, trying to help them move emotionally on from what happened with Omni-Man. They also reference how they clean up collateral damage in this universe too. Cecil usually hires teams of contractors to rebuild a lot of stuff outside of like major city reconstruction projects. So effectively, the US government kind of pays for a lot of this stuff, but you have to imagine that a lot of Cecil's department's funding comes from a lot of the technology that they hijack from a lot of these saves. So it's almost like they can develop or create as much money as they actually need at any given time. So it's not that big of a deal. Like if they can make all this advanced technology, they probably have access to a lot, a lot of quick money. They continue addressing Mark's obsession with proving himself to everyone, to Cecil, to the rest of the world, that he can still be a superhero, he's not going to turn out like his father. There are a lot of moments that question that during the episode too, where he seems like he could go either way, but that's also meant to be highlighted with this other universe version of Invincible who definitely went evil in the idea that in most universes, Invincible does wind up siding with his father. And this main version of Invincible is like the odd man out in that he did not turn evil. This also sets up the bit where she goes to confront Cecil about what's happening with Mark and sees Donald and they answer a lot of people's questions or at least address a lot of people's questions, not fully answering it, but at least addressing it. How was Donald here seemingly walking around none the worse for wear when he was blown to bits during season one? In the comics, Donald is a cyborg, so I'm guessing on the TV show what they'll say is that Cecil probably just had him rebuilt using some clone body parts and some mechanical parts and replace what was lost. And that's how they'll explain Donald has no memory of actually dying. Because it also seems like Cecil doesn't want him to remember what happened. My early guess right now, just based on this type of trope, is that they'll say on the show that Cecil has resurrected quote unquote Donald many, many times. Like he's died a bunch of times. This isn't the first time this happened. They go back to the Guardians of the Globe who are getting their asses handed to them by Immortal during their training. Bulletproof seems like he's the only one who's doing fine, but he is way, way more powerful than everybody else on the team. A lot of this storyline though is to put Rex Splode in his place because he was such a big butthole during season one and he's sticking up their training. He can barely handle it. Duplicate wants nothing to do with him, kind of giving him a taste of his own medicine like he cheated on Adam Eve with her during season one. And it also sets up Shapesmith joining the team like they need as much help as they can get so they need Shapesmith even as weird as he is. I love the way that they all kind of pick up on how crazy it's like wait what what did you just say like you seem so weird. My early guess is they'll figure out he's really a Martian pretty soon. Like they can definitely tell that he's lying to them. They also use this duplicate scene like the, the shower scene here to remind you that her duplicates can feel everything that the other ones are doing. So like the one out here talking to Rex Splode can feel the other two who are still getting it on the shower with the immortal. They use the memorial on TV from the previous Guardians of the Globe roster that Omni-Man killed to give Shapesmith the idea to replace Martian Man on the team. 
Love the idea that he's just eating frozen pizzas but not bothering to cook them. And the mascot of the pizza business is also a pizza themed superhero. He's probably got these because he's obsessed with being a superhero. It's like, oh, I'll buy a superhero pizza. During the broadcast, they also reference Aquarius to set up Mark's storyline later in the episode. Mark flies past the burger joint where he used to work in season one, where they've eaten at multiple times during the series. He just met with Cecil there during episode one, and it's also where Adam Eve's father is working now. He goes to Midnight City, which they mention briefly in season one, to pick up Darkwing's sidekick Nightboy, who's taken the mantle since Omni-Man killed the original Darkwing. Basically using his gear to continue being a superhero, it's meant to be like a big Robin Nightwing parody. But the way they're using him on the show, his personality is a little more unhinged, kind of like Red Hoods. But the whole idea is that Darkwing was their Batman parody, so this is more of like a Robin Nightwing parody. Midnight City is their parody of Gotham City. Within the Invincible Universe, it's called Midnight City because it was cursed by the Midnight Magician before the events of Season 1 back in 2002. That's around the time the Invincible comic book was first published, so it's a bit of a reference to the origins of the Invincible comic book. But when he killed himself, that's what laid the curse on the city, like the act of killing himself. Basically enveloping it in a perpetual darkness. Darkwing also had the ability to use the Shadow Dimension, which is a reference to Batman always seeming like he had superpowers because he had a clever way of using darkness and shadows to his advantage on his nightly patrols, taking out supervillains. Notice Ben Schwartz, who just got done voicing Shapesmith, is also doing the voice for this random thug. There's a lot in this episode of actors playing multiple characters, like the person who's voicing Nightboy voices like two other characters in the series. There's even a brief moment during their fight when Invincible pulls an Omni-Man kind of move on Nightboy, threatening to get him killed by the night creatures from that dimension until he takes him back, showing that even though he wants to be a hero, he does have it in him to be just as bad as the other Viltrumites. Like I said, just like the other versions of Invincible in the multiverse who all turned evil. The Shadowverse is basically like another dimension. It's kind of like a parody of the Shadow Dimension from Marvel. Invincible taking Amber to Vegas for a date is meant to be a reference to all the times Omni-Man took his mother to other countries for dates all the time. They also remind you about the physics of being a superhero like, oh, you know, I could fly you to Italy like another country, but all the skin would fly off your body if we did it faster than under an hour. Then he's forced to answer for Omni-Man's killing of Aquarius, and they have all the jokes about him almost marrying his wife. She's played by Tatiana Maslany, like I said, who also played She-Hulk in the MCU. She also played one of the Lizard League characters, Lizard Queen, during the Adam Eve prequel. The whole idea, though, is that the Atlanteans and the Invincible Universe are super powerful, and they are threatening to destroy the entire Eastern Seaboard if he doesn't go through with this. While this is going on, they set up the whole Lizard League storyline, which seems like it's going to become a bigger thing in future episodes. Generally, they're meant to be like a combination mashup of Cobra from G.I. Joe. There's a reference to the Terror Drome at the end of the episode, like that's their base. Everybody that watched the G.I. Joe TV show. Some of the internal politicking with like different members like Supreme Lizard trying to hijack the group is also a reference to some of the internal politicking within Cobra of G.I. Joe, like Cobra Commander versus Serpentor. Supreme Lizard is meant to be Serpentor, basically. They're also kind of a parody of the Serpent Society from Marvel and Cobra, also from DC, different Cobra organization. Just sounds like Cobra from G.I. Joe. Serpent Society will actually be some of the villains during Captain America 4, the movie that they're working on right now. There's been a long-running gag in the MCU that Kevin Feige is going to use the Serpent Society in Captain America movies. In the context of the Invincible Universe, though, King Lizard, who started the Lizard League, is actually like a mutant who basically gave himself powers. It seems like a lot of them do have some mutations that give them some low-level powers, but some of them are just wearing suits. They explain prior to the events of this season, King Lizard been arrested. He is one of the villains that Invincible winds up facing early in the comics, though. While he's been in jail, Supreme Lizard tried to usurp temporary control of the Lizard League until he obviously shows up at the end of the episode killing him. When they go back to the Atlantis storyline, this Atlantean guard is also voiced by the same person that just got done voicing Nightboy. He winds up having to fight the Depth Dweller, who's kind of like their version of the Carathen from Aquaman and DC. They jump back to Invincible's mother, who's trying to sell their house with her co-worker here. He's played by Cliff Curtis. Pretty notable actor for what seems like a relatively small role, but here's the connection. It's Robert Kirkman, who also does The Walking Dead. Cliff Curtis was also on Fear of the Walking Dead, so that's probably how he got him to be on this series. There are a lot of Walking Dead actors that show up throughout the Invincible. Really good example is The Immortal is played by Ross Marquand, who played Aaron on the original Walking Dead series. 
Notice when Invincible defeats the Depth Dweller, Cecil clocks that he was weak to its sonic attacks and has the Global Defense Agency make a note of it and start developing weapons as contingency plans in case they want to kill Invincible. It's the exact same thing he did with Omni-Man during Season 1 and preceding the events of Season 1. They showed him developing all kinds of contingency plans, trying to find ways to affect Viltrumite cells in case he needed to take Omni-Man out. Turns out he needed all of them, even though none of the things that he tried were actually successful in stopping Omni-Man. They also follow up on this whole idea in the post credit scene in the other universe with that evil version of Invincible who explains that their global defense agency was able to kill his father using special quantum bombs and they were able to get him when he was forced to sleep. So the idea is that there are versions of Cecil out there in the multiverse who do find ways of eventually killing and stopping Viltrumites. Then they reveal what happened to that original astronaut Shapesmith had been impersonating, revealing that the Sequids used him to take a Martian spaceship and are heading towards Earth to try and take over. They'll probably address that, but like Invincible will probably try and face them in the next couple of episodes at some point. When Shapesmith is lying to the Guardians of the Globe about how he got his power, saying that he got them in a random industrial accident, that's a joke about classic comic book tropes, like classic Stan Lee Marvel heroes, a lot of them, a lot of them got their powers from random industrial accidents. And when the Lizard King returns, killing Supreme Lizard, he's actually voiced by Scoot McNary, who was in Batman v Superman, but he's using a very different type of voice, so you wouldn't know it was him unless you watched the credits. Then they reveal in the post credit scene that Angstrom Levy travels back to that other universe that we saw in episode 1 with the evil version of Invincible and learns from this version of Invincible how they were able to kill his father and stop him. All because he's looking for ways to actually kill Invincible in the main universe. The Angstrom Levy storyline might conclude with the first half of season 1 or they might be for the entire season, not really sure because they're only doing 4 episodes then going on break and then doing the second 4 episodes early next year. You also notice that in this universe, Cecil and Donald are both women. I don't know what their names are, there weren't a lot of information about them in the credits, but basically it's the exact same characters but women versions. There's a whole bunch of easter eggs and references in the episode. If you spotted any that I didn't talk about in the video or you have any questions about what happened in the episode, just write them below in the comments. In my full episode 3 video, we'll post next week. Also, because we don't have Loki episodes anymore, I'll be posting my Invincible episodes a little bit sooner after they air. There were like 10 different videos I had to make this week just because so many big things came out all at the same time, so it took me a little bit longer to get this video out. Click here for my full Loki Season 2 Episode 6 finale video and click here for all my other Invincible videos. Thank you so much for watching, everyone stay safe, and I'll see you guys in the next one.